Welcome back to the Peaceful Political Revolution in America podcast. Human beings will soon be confronting a number of issues ranging from global warming to overpopulation, to name just a few. While we will undoubtedly benefit from new energy and digital technologies, we will also have to contend with the disruption caused by these emerging technologies and the system changes they will bring about. Looking forward, the potential to reinvent society has really never been greater. But whose vision of society will prevail? Clearly, there are many more innovations in the pipeline, and the pace of change will likely only accelerate. As we exit the Holocene and leap into the Anthropocene, I thought it would be a good time to take a look at the numerous system changes currently underway and how these inexorable trends might impact the future of democracy in the United States and around the world. As we transform our technologies, will we find the means to transform our political systems and to make them more democratic? Peter Leiden came to San Francisco in the 1990s to work with the founders of Wired magazine. He sharpened his forecasting skills while working with the Global Business Network and the legendary Stuart Brand. Considered a thought leader on future technologies and megatrends, Peter is the author of The Long Boom, The Coming Age of Prosperity, and co-author of What's Next, Exploring the New Terrain for Business. He has recently published an online series called The Great Progression on BigThink.com. Peter is the founder of Reinvent Futures, where he shares his foresight with leaders from numerous organizations around the world. He served on Barack Obama's Technology and Media Advisory Committee during his groundbreaking presidential campaign of 2008 and has given keynote talks for the last 25 years on roughly a monthly basis as a futurist and tech expert working through Kepler speakers. Peter is also one of the most optimistic and engaging people I have ever spoken with, and he is here today to talk with us about system change and the future of democracy. Peter, I've been looking forward to this conversation for weeks now. Welcome to the Peaceful Political Revolution in America podcast. It's great to have you here. Well, I'm very happy to be here and looking forward to the conversation. I've watched a lot of your presentations, The Long Boom. I want to get into your list of inexorables, The Long Now Foundation, The Reinvent Futures, The Transformation, you know, The Great Progression. You've, oh, my gosh, you've, you've, you've been followed it. Yeah, and how all of that relates to the future of democracy. Okay. Before we get into all those details, I want to talk about the big picture and what you see coming and... Again, why are you so optimistic when so many people are full of doom and gloom? Okay. What, what are the big things that you see coming that you want people to know about? Okay. Gosh, where, how should we start the lens on this one? Here, here's one of the things is most of your listeners, you know, um, or basically everybody, for the last 40 years, you could say, the world has had a kind of a relatively stable, believe it or not, system, um, meta system that was made up of all these subsystems. So, you know, we had our energy was carbon based. Our cars were, you know, internal combustion. Our politics was kind of, you know, the culture was dominated by the baby boom. The culture, you know, the politics was relatively conservative. Um, you know, we had a free market. We kind of unleashed the capitalism kind of uh, economics and shareholder kind of capitalism anyhow you can kind of go around the whole loop foreign policy was in the middle east why to keep the oil going to kind of keep the whole flywheel going so anyhow there was a whole kind of a system of systems uh that we got used to that you know media covered and understood how to talk about it and the politicians had solutions for that and all that stuff i'm saying that that system is 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 rapidly falling apart and reaching its end and and we're watching that fade and so one of the reasons that so many people are kind of very uh, gloom and doom right now and kind of very look at the future is very dystopian is because they kind of see that world going away and they don't really see what's happening. But what's interesting is if you take every one of those categories that kind of touched on there, 
there's a new kind of a system. Uh, these subsystems are emerging. So instead of carbon, as that's kind of all screwing up the climate and 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 running into problems in the Middle East, all that kind of stuff in Russia, it's like well, we've got clean energy taking off gangbusters. And you know, like instead of the internal combustion car clog and everything, blah blah blah, we got you know electric cars take it off and then you know the culture is now dominated more by the millennial generation and our politics i would argue is getting is becoming more progressive anyhow there's a whole way that the whole system is re-gelling in a more sustainable digital global kind of way i would say ultimately but what's confusing and difficult for most people is we're in the decade or the interregnum between these two clear different eras so if you're caught in the old thing, you kind of tend to see things as kind of falling apart. But if you're in the new thing, and that new thing is often defined by fundamentally new technologies that are enabling new things we can do and all kinds of stuff. If you're in that world of which I am and have been for the last 25, 30 years here, uh, rooted here in the Bay Area of, of San Francisco at all, um, you get really excited by the potential because you say, oh, my God, I can see how this is working. Oh, I understand how the whole electric car thing is going to work. Oh, I can see how we could solve climate through scaling up so you know all the renewable energy all that kind of stuff so anyhow it's a kind of a that's the main way i would say or one way in that i think a lot of people understand i spend a lot of time talking to senior leaders and boards and c-suites and doing talks all over the country and occasionally outside the country that's one way that people kind of kind of helps them see ah, i kind of get it better and so I spent a lot of my time helping people understand those new systems, how that's all merging into a kind of meta system and, and you know, where we're going to go in the next 10 to 25 years. And that's kind of what I do through my company. And, and that's how I do through my talks and my writing that you've kind of mentioned. So that's kind of one way to think of it. People love stability. So you're talking about, yeah. we've been in this zone for a long time now, but now everything yeah. is shifting and changing. Yeah. Now we're into another era altogether, right? Yeah. The Anthropocene. Yes. That's going to be a heavy lift. Yeah. The technologies you describe change things so much. On the other hand, I pick up my phone and call Verizon. No one's picking up the phone. In the long boom, you did put a list of spoilers in there, things that yeah. could possibly go wrong. One of them was a pandemic. Well, this so the listeners who don't know this, just the quick the quick version was in the mid '90s. I basically wrote a famous cover story in Wired magazine. Later, went into a book, went into multiple languages called "The Long Boom," and basically it was a largely positive story from my point of view of how the digital economy would roll out, the digital revolution would take place, the digital economy would roll out, and also globalization would stitch the world together, and all kinds of stuff would happen, like China would rise to be a superpower, a bunch of stuff that from the mid-90s, frankly, was a stretch. And people were like, oh, I don't know, what's some Amazon, and how is that ever going to be a big company? And, um, and yeah, a lot of that stuff turned out. But I also wrote 10, what you right, I call them scenario spoilers that could happen and come uh, come about that would slow things down. And frankly, all 10 of them literally happened, including, as you mentioned, I said from the mid 90s, said, you know, at some point we're probably going to get another global pandemic. And I said, it's going to be close to what happened in the, the 1918 kind of, you know, Spanish flu thing, which killed 50 million people. Anyhow, and in terms of it, we got it by 2020. So it, there's a, but all 10 of them came through. But here's the extraordinary thing I will say to about it. It didn't actually slow down much. The actually overarching story I was talking about, which is, oh, these little startups are going to be trillion dollar companies. Oh, you know, uh, anyhow, you can kind of go through the whole thing. And um, so anyhow, it's, it's an interesting thing. But yes, I would say there's negative things out there, but I would also just largely say to the, to you, you know, for all our hand wringing about social media and the issues that it brings, people are quick to forget how many good things it brings. Like for every kind of election fraudster on Facebook, there's, you know, millions of families who are sharing their kids' photos and the grandparents with the kind of the extended families and you're connected to your old high school and college, grade school friends and like who i mean you couldn't have even done that there's even remotely possible like 20 years ago so i mean there is there there is a side thing that i kind of just want to remind people there that it isn't how it all been boom or doom uh when you really think about all this stuff all the discussion about system change and transformations and progressions i hear very little conversation about the political system you talk about a generational shift, broadly speaking, a more progressive politic going on, but the political system itself is still an outdated 18th century political system. 
there's a bunch of ways to go at it, but I, I would say there's two ways I think of it in a big picture way to think about it is, and I, we could go either direction or both at some point, but th there is a hopeful evolution of where, how America worked within the, its kind of constraints of this 18th century kind of model. It has over time gotten to these junctures periodically where it has transformed itself uh but still working within the constraints of the general constitution and things like that and it has gotten us to move forward and i would say there's a way i talk about the evolution of politics in that context meaning how without even fundamental constitutional reform how you could actually imagine a be much better future i would argue that a lot of that innovation is coming out of california now and it's showing a new way forward that for the next 40 years just like i said the last 40 are kind of falling apart. I think the next 40 are going to are getting roughed out now of how it's going to work. So there's one way that's kind of more practical way of thinking about how politics works today and how it might work in the next um, few decades. But I would say where you are going, which I actually also share is even a bigger picture way to think about it, which is basically our uh, system of politics, you know, built in the you know 1780s, and it was essentially a creature of the Enlightenment, and there was essentially so many fundamental kind of systems that our modern world is still kind of trapped in or built off that were essentially invented, whole scale invented in the in 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 the uh, the Enlightenment. I mean, you can go down to like mechanical engines were invented. Industrial production was invented. Uh, financial capitalism was invented. I mean, literally, there was nothing before, and then all of a sudden, boom, we figured it out. And then, um, but also stuff like the nation state and democracies and liberal democracies. Now, these are like you know world historical developments that were really unprecedented. I mean, there was some echo of oh, you know, ancient Greece or something. We kind of knew a little bit around smattering of democracy, but in general. Those were world historical thresholds that humans kind of crossed for the first time, and it essentially has defined the world for the last 250 years. And and and, for, and in many respects, been very positive in many of those things and spreads prosperity and growth and all kinds of stuff were great. It's also brought us into a ton of problems, inequality, climate change, and all kinds of stuff, right? So um, I would just argue from that framework, we are well overdue. I totally share with you, well, well, well overdue for a fundamental upgrade. So, for example, just thinking how the founders in, you know, in 1870, they didn't even know what electricity was. I mean, you had, you know, Ben Franklin out there with a kite trying to figure out, okay, what is electricity coming from lightning, let alone electronics, you know? I mean, so if the fun, the founding fathers, they're all were guys, as we know, um, if they were today and they looked around and said, damn, these digital computers and everyone's connected with high bandwidth connections is like, what well, they'd be saying, why wouldn't we be doing, let's work with that stuff. You know, that's a lot better. To my mind, the world is on the threshold of another level of civilizational change, as you could say. The last time we saw a civilization be born was essentially the Enlightenment. And it was born in, East, you know, basically Western Europe. It was really rooted. The ground zero was in London. I mean, but it also was through Europe. It, we had a little smattering of it here with the, you know, innovation around politics and democracy. But in general, that was a, you know, about 100 years of crazy innovation uh, that we're still kind of in now. But so, but I feel, and I think there's a case to be made that we're entering another period that is analogous to that where I think we're going to go through such fundamental system changes that the only way to objectively think about it would be essentially a, a civilizational change. Meaning, for example, if you are going to build an all digital kind of society that has intelligent machines and AI kind of, you know, energizing all our human systems, that's a different animal than what they were tinkering around with in, 18, in 1780. And it's just, and it requires a completely different way of thinking about stuff. And then the same thing is if you're going to work on a planetary scale to solve climate change, you, you can't be trapped in the nation state thing that they did in 1870s too, or the 1770s, uh, 1780s. And so the question to me is, there are people like you and me talking like that in terms of the big picture, but what's also happening is this, just like I talked about the drag between the two 40-year eras, you can think about this as the drag between two fundamental historical era, just like the Enlightenment era, and now this, I would call it a 21st century kind of era, 
But that mind shift takes such a crazy amount of open-mindedness and, and, and adaptability that, you know, it's it's really hard. And so this is why you're seeing, literally, I will explain, I mean, why is the conservative wing of the Republican Party, which is essentially the Republican Party now, why are they so obsessed with what they call originalist thinking or, you know, go back to the exact interpretation of, of the original constitution it's because they're definitely hanging on to this thing because they know if they let go of that thing it's going to be so different going forward that it, it's just going to be unrecognizable so i think that's where we are and i think in our i don't know i'm my lifetime it could happen um in terms of the fundamental rebirth of a very different constitution and all kinds of different ways to think about but it's also possible it might take more a few more a couple more decades or a few but but at some point it's going to happen it's going to happen in this century I brought it up to my friends and family years ago, and they would all say, well, not very likely. In the last couple of years, I'll bring it up with strangers. And they say, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> we need a new constitution. I don't have to convince anybody that the political system is broken. Yeah, it's, it's so obvious to everybody, especially the younger generation, like you talk about the millennials and Gen Z. Yeah, These guys are going like, oh, yeah. a, a new political system? you kidding me? Of course we need a new political system. Yeah. That's true. We could have a parliamentarian system that would be way more democratic than what we have now. Structural changes to the political system, abolishing the Senate, the Electoral College, introducing proportional representation. Proportional representation would create a multi-party system and it would end gerrymandering. So who's against that? I mean, I, there's an argument that multi-party systems aren't as good as a two-party mm -hmm. system. I get that. But mm -hmm. most modern and effective democracies are multi-party systems. Mm -hmm. Aaron Lippard wrote a book called Patterns of Democracy. Now, he studied 36 different democracies around the world mm. and compared them. He had a list of 10 things that we could do to create a more democratic and more effective government in the United States, which he supports. But I would even go further, just, just for the sake of stirring the pot here, it's like, you're still, I mean, parliamentary systems are also still rooted in enlightenment thinking. I mean, it, it, it's all kind of, you know, it's an evolution from Britain's system that we evolved from. Anyhow, it's all still like that. So, and French, you know, democracies and stuff. So um, I think it's probable, maybe not you and me might not see this, but I do think that this century, which, by the way, all the millennials are going to live to see the end of the century and the Gen, Gen Z is for sure, you know, barring some crazy catastrophe that's you know whatever that is truly dystopia but let's just assume the world is going to roll you know in a way that those kids will have a normal life relatively normal lives that if in that period i would go so far as to say to conjecture that we will go into a fundamentally different way of thinking of democracy and i to me it has to be rooted it, to my mind, in digital technologies, computer technologies, and I would say weirdly, even because because this is freaking people out right now, it almost certainly will be leveraging the power of AI. And not to make AI control us or, you know, be our, that crazy thing is not happening. But it, I think what's happening now, and people are, it's just dawning on people. And I'm, you know, here in San Francisco, it's gone berserk the last six months here on generative AI and stuff. And I think at least my perspective on this which is more positive and optimistic about the future is it is giving us, I think a superpower here that, you know, for now is just freaking people out and, sh you know, kind of shaking the, you know, everybody up. But I think in this century, it's going to allow us to essentially do what the goal of democracy is, is like, how do you get reasonably the will of the people, the actual will of the people, or the majority of people protecting, you know, minority rights. I get that. But basically, how do we effectively figure out what the majority wants and then efficiently and effectively carry out that will in kind of effective government? Now, you know, that was the idea 250 years ago, and it's the idea is still. But the point is, the way to carry that out in the 21st century, you'd be basically insane not to take advantage of the tools we have in our, in our powers now and just say, oh, no, we're just going to do the same thing we did, you know, two centuries ago. And because, well, that's the way we do it. 
I, I just think that's not going to hold. And I think it's not going to hold particularly in the world that we're heading into, which is got to be kind of thought about on a planetary scale and a kind of global systems, because there's only so many ways 10 billion people are going to be able to kind of sustain on this planet. And it ain't going to be, you know, some minority of farmers in Wyoming are going to hold up the whole damn thing because, well, that's where we did it, you know, in 1870, you know, or, or whatever it is, you know, so it's like that traditional thing just ain't going to happen in the same way that you said, um, and this isn't crazy talk. This is like you say, I mean, Nazi Germany collapsed. They started over, you know, kind of fascist, you know, kind of uh, Japan collapsed. They started over. I mean, it's it's not like we can't figure out how to do this. It's in our lifetimes or my dad's lifetime. We've seen that. Right. So it's like gonna something's going to happen, I think, in a big, profound way. Honestly, I hope so. I mean, I call it a peaceful political revolution. I, I don't know. I mean, you're talking about technology revolution, purpose revolutions, all kinds of revolutions. I don't hear any political revolution happening. I think that's the real cornerstone of the next new civilization, right? To me, it's designed around the political system. You mentioned foundation. Do you know what kind of government that was? In the science fiction stories? In the science fiction story. Did they have did they have a government? They, well, there's two there's two systems that in that book. So for your readers just to understand what's going on, one of the great sci-fi writers of all time was uh, uh, Isaac Asimov. He was writing at the beginning of mainstream computers in in basically the 18, in 1950s. So computers were just starting, and also the information age was just starting. And anyhow, he he created a three part three kind of it's like a trilogy, basically rooted. And ultimately, it had more more um, books, but let's just call it the initially it was a trilogy, in which they he had a character that because of all the this is a thousand years in the future where there's so we we know so much about everything information and we have powerful tools i.e. computers and AI that can help you essentially predict the future with precision like you could know like the future of your history and what's going to happen and what he does in this book series is he predicts the downfall of the of the empire of that time which is an intergalactic empire going across galaxies and all kinds of stuff um you know typical sci-fi on that level but what so there's two systems in that thing there was the old empire system that fell apart essentially was the core of the story and then there was a more democratic foundation of scientists and technologically uh kind of more selfless people essentially who weren't as corrupt and you know into power as the empire and they essentially hold out while the entire empire collapses so they can rebuild civilization and humanity efforts so that's the basic way to think of it so it was a democracy that they had it was, the one that survives is ultimately democracy but the one that collapses which is the bulk of the story is the collapse of the empire which is you know, more like a proto-fascist kind of government or something Exactly. Yeah. Yes. It, it was run by one guy who's an emperor and the whole thing. Uh -huh. So, like, like Avatar, you have this nation state that's depleting the resources and robbing yeah. everybody from what they want. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to me because that's kind of a vague description. Okay, you have a democratic this uprising of people. That how do they make all that happen? You're talking about a digital political system of some sort, a digital democracy. Is that what they had? Is that what they used in foundation? Or was it something other than that? I mean, what was the system? Because we're talking about political systems and how they work. I could I could specifically say proportional representation, uh, get rid of the Senate altogether, just abolish it, have one legislature, not a bicameral one. There are specific things that I see that would enhance the democratic nature of our government how would digital well first of all let, yeah so so let me just remember when i started the conversation from my side i was saying there's two ways to think about the the future of politics one is relatively rooted in evolving and reforming the existing structures expanding them um and, and I think the way you're talking when you say well we get rid of the you know bicameral kind of you know senate and and, and that kind of thing, but that's still relatively in the in in sync with you know what we've known as democracy, right? Oh, so now it's just a majority House of Representatives or something that runs, which is a totally definitely a positive thing and probably a much more probable thing in the near term is something like that will happen. And like we'll expand. That. I would say in the next ten to twenty years, 
I would say it's potentially as early as the next 10 years, particularly with the pressure of climate change and everything else is starting. I think you can see several reforms that are going to basically happen. I think one is you're going to expand the Supreme Court. I think that is going to happen. Um, I think you're going to basically see either an expansion of the number of states by adding them to just kind of balance out the Wyoming's and places that don't even have a million people but are voting red. Um, so you'll either see that or you'll see some kind, and you will basically abolish the Electoral College for, for presidential votes. I mean, anyhow, there will be some things that are within the system we already have. You could actually see a way forward that would still allow that system to work a lot better and and and, and more democratic and, and more operational and not paralyzed all the time. So that, that thing I think is very possible and there's a whole way to talk about that and why there's generational change coming there's all kinds of stuff happening that that i think is uh is could we could play that scenario out and i think it's happening i have a whole series called which you might have read the uh california's the future i mean essentially what happened in california i would argue this is a kind of a way to go in that direction is to say california used to be a red state then California, which is back around Reagan and all that, we innovated the whole, I'm sitting here now, but I wasn't there now then, but essentially, uh, you know, that was a red state. I mean, we invented modern conservatism was out of California. Then there was a 50-50 state where nothing got done. That was from about the, not through the 90s and the early 2000s was essentially nothing got done in California because we were in a 50-50 thing and nobody could get the upper hand. That is essential. Uh, and then we eventually shifted to a total blue state supermajorities coming out with the Dems. But it's not like when you look at California, you say, oh, they're always been blue or they're always just people. No, it's not true. This is an evolution of the political culture of California to deal with the you know, immigration, which kind of changed the face of California, climate change, all kinds of technological changes, all these economic changes, these things. So California is adapted. And now they are a supermajority blue state. I would argue that is essentially a precursor of what the country's going through. In other words, we've kind of had a 40-year run of the cons more conservative kind of government, which you could argue good or bad, it, that's happened. The last 10 years or more have been, 20 years even, you could say, have been this crazy-ass you know, paralysis, 50-50 kind of thing. Maybe the last 10 years, think of it as. And now we're entering a shift because people are getting so frustrated. We got to move it. And there's a lot of pressures and there's a lot of demographic changes. Same things that changed California, demographic changes, climate pressures, economic changes, digitization, global interconnection to the world, blah, blah, blah. All the stuff that happened in California is now happening all through the country. So I would argue just on the default of the existing system, you're going to see essentially Blue America win this decade, basically. And that you will essentially create a, a United States of America under kind of be like a California model, think of it as, just like we saw a California model with Reagan and that whole tax revolt and everything else go. It'll be a similar thing like that. And I think that's a reasonable way the country could go and could survive and, you know, evolve in this climate change thing. That's one scenario. And, and just to hold this thought for a second, which we can continue to talk about, the bigger idea is that maybe it's going to take longer than the next 10, 20 years, but it's possible that even that that those constraints of that model of hey this is how it works you got to get elected to this and the broken you know senates and the you know representatives and all that stuff that it could even go another leap up and i think that's actually but that's a longer lens but i would say for example you know polling think of it as just like Polling is a crude way to do this but if now that we have ais and you know we're just starting ai so let's say 10 years into ai we're going to have to maybe tools that'll make super precise what, you know, the 60% majority of the want. And you know what, you know, then the millennials are running things and the Gen Zers are running things and the climate is like crushing the country. And you're like, okay, we're not going to listen to this knucklehead crew in South Dakota who's holding up the whole damn thing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they'll just say, we're going to do it differently in a fundamental way. And I, I think it's possible that that could happen. That I'm less confident about that, but I am very confident that the politics of California are coming to the rest of the country. It's already happening. Harvey J.K. and, and Alan Minsky from the Progressive Democrats said that he wants to, he's floating a, an idea for a new economic bill of rights like, like FDR, right, had during the 40s. And you talk about FDR in one of your presentations. And 
I know you're aware of how things changed under his administration, which was what, six, 16 years? Yeah. After that, it took 60 years, they undid everything. Now we're in the, the middle of the second Gilded Age. This political system, because of the way it was designed to protect the minority of the opulent, that's, you know, that's a good point. You know, that's the way it was designed. How do you get around that design so that in the long term, it works consistently for the majority and represents the will of the people of the United States? Well, I would say, yeah, I like where you're going with that, and it's a very smart analysis, and I largely agree with it. So, so I guess the way I would say is, there's a there's one way you could think of American history is it's a basically a pendulum swing between conservative eras and progressive eras, and that there's a a kind of a I think of it as roughly a forty year cycle, and it's weird if you go back through all of American history. Uh, it's roughly does hit this about every, and, and there's, so there's some kind of logic to it at some level, which is you get one kind of, let's say a conservative era has a certain kind of pro business and more elite status and inequalities, but it's also kind of a, unleashes some entrepreneurial energies and a bunch of stuff that, you know, you could also argue is, is maybe a good thing once in a while. Um, but anyhow, those periods get to this point where, you know, then it gets, you know, starts breaking down, it gets corrupt, it, you know, it's not working, and even even by what it is. And then the pendulum swing kind of swings the other way. And then you get a progressive era, which is which is more innovative, more forward motion, more looking out for everybody, you know, more kind of egalitarian, you know, more, you know, there's a often tuned into the environment, and things like that, a little bit more. That swings into that world and those were and that works for a while and but then those two also get corrupt it doesn't work it's like after a while just stay out we're kind of tired of it doesn't work so it swings back so i it's not it's weird but you could actually look through an american history and it, it roughly hits us now you pointed out and we've brought up already the two two of the junctures where the reagan uh so so the fdr juncture was that was the last time you could say america the last time of many times though it's been through this cycle it was the last time in recent memory where we opened up a progressive era that was the post-war boob at all the GI Bill at all the Great Society at all the stuff that we know, right? That thing was highly successful, but by the 70s, it was like, you know, it was not working and everything was kind of getting stale and corrupt and it wasn't working. And then you watch this thing go to the conservative side, which kind of cleaned up and whacked back the bureaucracy and unregulated stuff and got things moving again. You could argue, again, I'm just trying to be somewhat neutral between these eras. Like there's some positive things, but there's also a negative stuff, which unleashed all this gilded age and inequality and stuff like that. So I would just argue by 2020, Trump was the last gasp of that praising on, holding on to that conservative era. And it is gone. It's, you know, and, you know, Trump is trying again and he'll never, in my opinion, he'll never win again. Uh, and so it's gonna it's it's gonna take the Republicans a while to get off that crazy ass horse. And but so we're opening up. I would argue strongly. We're arguing we're moving into a a more consolidated era of essentially blue America dominance, in which the furthest reaches of how advanced it is is close. It's California for better or worse. I mean, there's not not everything in California is awesome, but it's kind of what america is going to be in the next 10 20 years i would say if you look at it that way but then there's this other track which is interesting about this conversation which is even that is not going to necessarily solve this structural bias to the system to eventually re-up itself and reorient itself back to that plutocratic kind of dominant thing that oligarchic thing and so we got to solve that now that takes constitutional convention or that takes really fundamental reforms yeah, exactly. I mean, if we don't have a true democracy, a full democracy, what what's going to prevent a third Gilded Age? I don't know. Well, you know, a couple, couple of thoughts here. Um, before we get to the long now, which, which we should go back to because it's a different, that's another perspective on things. There's a Long Now Foundation is is a foundation here uh, based in San Francisco, but it's a kind of a global organization, which was founded by Stuart Brand and a bunch of kind of early people of his era to kind of think long term, to make long term thinking kind of a constant and regular kind of way of thinking about things. When they say long term, they'd be really long term. So like they're kind of thinking like they're, they're building a clock, which is almost done now, by the way. 
uh, which is a clock that will, literally will last for 10,000 years without human intervention. It's, it's underground in a mountain in uh, Texas right now. And it's going to become a shrine for, you know, 10,000 years. Like, so if we nuke ourselves to death, you know, the, the whatever, the animals will crawl over it and stuff. But um, but anyhow, that's the point was just why are they doing that? Because they just think, you know, hey, we've had civilization for 10,000 years. Well, we should be thinking forward 10,000 years. So anyhow, there's a bigger picture thing. I've been involved with these guys for a long time. I've been um, I've actually literally worked some for them. I've basically been in and out of that world for the whole 25 years. There is a refreshing way to think about it. But I would say what's interesting about them, which I think you this is why I brought it up, is they aren't political. And weirdly, I think there's this there's this interesting thing i'm a very political guy and i think po about politics all the time and 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 think you got to talk about politics because like you it sounds like politics if you don't talk politics you're not really serious about how society is going to evolve and things happen because you need essentially the um the weight of essentially governments and the, and the kind of um mass kind of will behind things to make long-term historical changes but they don't go there. And one of the reasons they don't go there is what's happened in this country, certainly in recent decades, but it's uh, kind of always a problem, is is um, when you talk politics, you, it often alienates people. It also, it could, it could, you know, it's a light, it, it's a it's a third rail in a way. So you'll piss off the people who, you know, think one way and another way. And so pretty soon you get this crazy toxic space. And so a lot of people just say, well, fuck it. I'm not going to, you know, then even touch it. I was down at Stanford to listen to Russ Feingold talk about his book, The Constitution in Jeopardy. I wanted to go hear Russ talk about it. And then after the program, I was out in the courtyard with the head of the Constitutional Law Center. I asked him, I said, why aren't people talking about creating a more democratic constitution, because obviously the one we have is very limited in terms of its democratic features. It's kind of stifles democracy in a lot of ways. And he said, oh, that would be the worst thing. I wouldn't want to see that happen. There are people out there who don't want a more democratic society. Oh, yeah. No, there's, there's a lot of people defending it. And there's, there's a lot of people that won't let go of it. Here's one thing, though, I want to say, which would shift a little bit of the what you're saying there, I just want to remind you and basically the, the, the listeners for that matter, for all our worries and moaning and, and kind of um, hand-wringing about the state of democracy in America, or for that matter, Western Europe even, um, it's kind of compared to what? Because the other way to think about it is like China, the other superpower of the world, which you, pretty much everyone seems to agree on is, you know, is China. Well, if you're in China and you're not, if you're not Xi, <laughs> the, the guy, the supreme commander who just, by the way, broke the system of their era where every 10 years you turn over the leadership and he just extended it for essentially another potentially ever, he could stay in there forever. If you're not him, you know, you don't want to necessarily be in China talking politics or doing anything around politics because, and I know, actually, I have a lot of friends because I used to be a foreign correspondent in Asia, by the way. I, in fact, have covered uh, China. I was in China after Tiananmen Square. I've been in a Chinese jail, weirdly, uh, after that. I mean, there's a lot of stories I can go there. But also, I had a lot of journalist friends in um, Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, they've just destroyed Hong Kong in the last five years. And it's just the guy who's supreme guy just says, no, we're doing it this way. And, you know, that's the way you go. And, and then he goes, oh, the tech world is too kind of powerful, kind of uh, they, their version. And then I'm just going to lop their heads off and they're going to jail. In comparison, you got a point there, but look at the inequality in the United States right now. It's, it's at record levels. Look at the inequality in Brazil. Yeah, but in China, weirdly in China, it, China has the same, it's, I think it's, it, and these numbers are pretty close because I've used these numbers before. It's roughly about a third of the wealth of if, of both the United States and of China is in the hands of I think the top five percent of the of the of the uh, country or maybe it's even the top one percent. Anyhow, it's huge inequalities, but it's also in China. But what's interesting is the Chinese let it go for a while while they're doing their capitalist version, but then they just lop the heads off these guys. Now, what I guess what I'm just going to say is to finish the story of this is in the long run in these junctures of transformation with oh the arrival of climate change and oh the arrival of you know ai and these things 
as messy as our country is and it's kind of crazy and kind of chaotic as it can be at times you'd rather have a pluralistic democratic society or democratic in name society now so that you and i can be arguing like this and there's the right wingers that argue like this are the same thing i mean and, and because if you can't do this in china i mean if you if we were doing this in china they you'd be the guys would be knocking on your door I'm going to argue that that's a pretty low bar. I mean, <laughs> we are a free society. Okay, I get that, and we're really glad for that. <laughs> Bloomberg said the 50 richest Americans now hold as much wealth as half of the U.S. That's from Bloomberg. Well, Bloomberg, that's a pretty reliable source. No, I'm not promoting it. I'm just saying that said is, boy, Putin or, or G or like, where do we go? I mean, it's like, what's a better system? Yeah, David Attenborough has a new movie out called Breaking Boundaries, where he discusses the various thresholds that were breaking through where these uh, systems collapse. There's like nine of them. He said we're breaking two or three of them now. We're, we're scheduled to break through three or four more very soon. So in other words, the urgency, I think, couldn't be much greater. I would love to think that Biden's climate initiative was enough. It's not. Clearly, it's not enough. I, I don't know if, I don't think Trump's going to get elected either. But let's say Biden comes back in and we have the ma the MAGA crowd still in Congress. We're, we're running out of time is all I'm saying. And I think that this conversation about how we could create a more effective democracy in the United States is urgent to get out. So here's, here's what I'll say, just building off what you're saying is, I'm not saying Biden is the transformational character, but um, but I do think uh, in the current situation where we're at, um, I think he did lay some foundational pieces like the IRA and, you know, moving $360 billion and plus into the <clears throat> climate economy, all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> There's a lot, a lot of things that you'd much rather, it's a lot better having him there. Um, but I would say, I think the story, so if I had to make a prediction, which is rare, I shouldn't, you know, I should be cautious about this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my my short term thing is that Biden will win this election. Um, Trump will drag down the Republicans into a era of soul searching and rebuilding and, you know, kind of like Reagan did to, um, you know, basically the Dems. I mean, the Dems just kept trying to put back the same liberal, you know, candidates, uh, Mondale, and, you know, then it was Dukakis. And anyhow, we just kept serving them up and they'd get flattened every time, right? Um, anyhow, that's going to be kind of a MAGA Trump thing for a while if they don't get their shit together pretty soon. Now, eventually they will probably reform and there'll be some new Ronald Reagan that'll come out the other end somehow. But anyhow, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, the scenario I think is going to happen is this, the transformation isn't going to come with the Biden administration or this election, but it's going to at least hold the piece, the fingers in the dike enough to kind of make the system hang, at least in not go backwards and probably lay the groundwork for even bigger stuff to come. But I would say the next election after that, I would say someone like, um, I would say Gavin Newsom or I would say a younger generation, a more transformative candidate, a more savvy kind of, you know, arguer who can really take on the, the red state kind of bugaboos and, you know, and just really build a 60-40 coalition that just rolls in the same way you flip Texas or you flip, you know, some of these red states that are just getting young millennials moving there and buying the houses and pretty soon there's like, you know, damn, it flips. If you start to get those kind of flips going on and and that then you could build essentially uh the majorities that we had in the post war uh, kind of era where you can literally just get through giant infrastructure projects you can really change educational systems you can you know do go to the moon you can do a bunch of stuff right you go you go kind of nutty on uh ambitious things I think that's where I would say I'd be looking for and then by the way you can expand the Supreme Court or threatened the Supreme to do it like the way FDR did. I mean, FDR just threatened to expand it and they kind of got over themselves and shifted. And so I think there, there's a way you can kind of navigate this without, you know, having to rebuild the entire constitution. But with time, I could imagine after you roll with that for a decade or two of, you know, kind of a, a kind of a similar to what happened in the fifties and sixties or something, 
that you'd get to a place where you might have a constitutional convention that people say, you know, this is just insane. We can't keep working within these constraints. And that, you know, you maybe you would have something more fundamentally different. And that, you know, in the lifetime of our kids or our grandkids, it'll just be taken as the normal way it goes. And then it's just gonna be, oh yeah, sure, we did that. And just, you know, it'll be it'll be 2040 or 2050 or something. We had the constitutional convention, and you know what? They fundamentally revised it and by the way to live with climate change and to live with whatever a planetary kind of uh challenges of you know you know every five years we got another global pandemic or something I mean, there'll be something that'll make us have to do something you know and so i think it's it's i think that's pro i you know without being crazy talk there's something along those lines is in our future i think i want you to say it's one of the inexorables <laughs> Well, the inexorables are a little different animals. Those are like going to happen under any scenario. That one I just said is a little bit more hopeful, but in my own wishes. I kind of think it is, though. There doesn't seem to be a better system than democracy for organizing countries. Up till now. Maybe I'm an anarchist deep down inside. I'd like to get to that point where we don't need a government. That'd be great. Okay, if our society is functioning that well and people understand what equality means on that level... We probably wouldn't need a government. That's great. But that's probably a couple hundred years away. There was a study done about what impact the average American has on policy in the United States. Zero. Zero. <laughs> Gillens and Page out of Princeton did a, did a study about that. We do not have any impact on policy. Oh. So my point is only that, yes, all these things are going to help and we're going to move and generational shifts are going to happen. That's great. I'm really looking forward to seeing that happen. But wouldn't it be wonderful if you could say, yeah, I was part of that generation that established a fully functional democracy in the United States for the first time. And actually the majority have has the tools now to express what they want and to achieve the goals that they're after. That's, we don't have that. The majority are not going to be able to do that until they have the tools to do that. The digital revolution will empower them to a degree, but the political system itself has so many blocks and vetoes and ways of preventing progress in that sense that it's not likely to be a massive change like we need. And if you want to create a new society where the majority are actually in control, all I'm saying is, we better start having a conversation about what that's going to require. I happen to know what it is. And well, do, do you tell? Do you tell? No, I mean, what is it? It's, yeah, it's just there's. It's not a secret. I've talked to fourteen or fifteen different constitutional scholars. Pretty much, they all agree. Uh, it's like the answers are pretty well known, which is stunning to me. And one of them has a proposal for creating a national convention coordinating committee and you know that would get the whole process started i think hmm. i think it's brilliant i think it needs to happen i'm i'm constantly looking for funding and partners for that uh initiative because i think that's fundamentally what we need to to work on so that's a book called making an, a new american making a new american constitution by uh, george van cleve a great guy and aaron lippard patterns of democracy basically if you put those two guys in the room together you'd have a country that would be fully democratic in a couple of couple of days you know and it would function function like a modern democracy should not like an oligarchy which we will continue to be going forward and what scares me about your predictions is that if this is going to be a boom on steroids Where's the wealth of the society going to go? Under this system, it's going to go to the top. Well, maybe. I mean, because we've had past booms. Uh, for example, we had a huge boom coming off World War II. In fact, you could argue the biggest economic boom in American history was coming off of World War II. And it was also a technological boom. We we built out, you know, interstate highways and cars and suburbs and, you know, rebuilt cities and skyscrapers and you, you name it. And but it was a very democratic system. And but, you know, the the rates of, you know, uh, I think the 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 essentially tax rate for the upper one percent was like something like 90 percent or something. I mean, it was a nominal. So not a lot of people paid the 90, but they paid incredibly more than the 35 percent now. I mean, 
So you can rework the system. If it's a true democracy or even close to a democracy, you can just say, well, screw it. We're going to basically, you know, not let that kind of inequality get out of control. And after the World War II and the 30s and all the collapse of the economy and everything else, people said, damn, we're just not going there, folks. And we built that society. Now, then Reagan came back after, you know, in the 80s and, you know, came back as a, you know, kind of a counterweight and was like, you know, yeah, but we need to kind of revitalize the economy and, oh, yeah, you know, but, but I mean, you know, the point being is it's not like we haven't tried, you know, have lived through boom, tech booms and economic booms that are essentially spread the wealth and prosperity pretty, you know, lovely through society. Uh, I think it didn't work out that way in the last boom, though. The tech boom? Yeah, because we ended up in the second Gilded Age. I mean, so there was no, no yeah. Well, that was a conservative era, like you say. Yeah, in that context, you cut taxes, cut regulations, uh, and then you ended up having shareholder capitalism and gorging the top. But that was a system change. That wasn't necessarily a function of, oh, it's a new technology, so that automatically happens. It's like, oh, you can introduce a new technology in an economic and social system that doesn't necessarily engorge the rich. It takes political will, and it takes you know organization and all that stuff. What I guess what I'm saying is it's not inevitable that the next, and it's not just AI boom. Because there's there's three booms that are going to happen here, and this could be a whole other conversation because I do a lot of talks on that. But it's not just AI is the next wave of the digital revolution. But there's the whole clean tech energy, eventually fusion energy kind of boom that's happening, and then there's uh, the biotech, synthetic biology, biological engineering boom, and it is true that there are companies that are going to make a lot of money in that space. But it's also true that there's uh, there's no um, reason, objectively, that you could refashion the context of making wealth in those contexts to say, hey, nobody can beat make a billion dollars, you know, or, you know what, we're going to tax anyone over, you know, 20 million bucks or something, you're going to end up having to be taxed at 75% of your wealth. Or we're going to basically, anyhow, a million ways you can do it. And we've done it. I mean, people have done this in the past. It, and it includes, it's including in Europe. So, I mean, I'm just trying to say is the political, the, the anti-tech, I'm not saying you're anti-tech, but a lot of people get anti-tech thinking that it follows that if you pour in a new technology, it's going to create these super elites. It's not really true. Um, uh, and I'll give you a good example. I mean, you know, think of it as, in the post-war world, essentially the technology, the boom of that time was automobiles, right? In, in Detroit and the whole kind of thing. And, you know, by the way, Ford, who is known as a kind of a, you know, a, a kind of a, a, you know, Gilded Age Ford, that was 19, you know, that was like 1906, he started the Model T and that stuff. So that was still in the kind of 20s, 10s and 20s where it was more free market and let those guys get in court. But after the war, those people running those GM and all that kind of stuff, they were a managerial class. You don't have those great, you know, oh, this guy made an insane amount of money. There weren't no Elon Musk, George, you know, Be Bezos characters in the in the post-World War. But they but they had incredible, but you know what happened in the post-world world? The different system said, hey, we're gonna cut a deal. There's literally a thing called the uh, Treaty of Detroit, where they basically cut a deal with the unions at the time. They said, look, we're gonna give you the first time. Paid vacations. We're going to give you health care. We're going to give you, you know, um, the cost of living raises. We're going to, they spread the wealth of that boom into the kind of working crew and created an entire middle class. Now, that was a political decision and it was essentially a, or an economic system decision. But the point is, it didn't, it's not a function of the technology boom of that time created extreme inequality. It's the political system of that time spread the wealth. And everybody loved it. Oh, that's very true. I, <laughs> I can't argue with that, Peter. Um, you know, and there have been moments in American history when inequality has been confronted head on. But as Alan Minsky and uh, Harvey J.K. pointed out on the podcast, these gains, you know, the Great Society, the New Deal, uh, they've been under attack for <laughs> almost a century. <laughs> so uh, it swings back and forth is all I'm saying. And I guess you're saying the same thing. Generationally, I agree. I think it looks to me like we are moving into a more progressive era, uh, and the system itself is 
in my view, though, just not designed to protect the interests of the majority. So why would any of us want to keep it is my question. Anyway, Peter, I got to wrap it up. You got to go. How can people stay in touch with you and where are they going to find you if they're looking for you? Well, first of all, anyone who wants to find out about me can always go to my website, which is peterleiden.com, which is my name, Peter, one word, Peter Leiden, L-E-Y-D-E-N.com. That ties together all my social media, where I'm at, who I am, bios, the whole thing, and my speaking, all the things I do. The second thing is I run a company, I founded and run a company called Reinvent Futures, which is at reinvent.net, as, uh, which is another kind of company that you could say, which is a strategic foresight company that I do. I do a lot of advisor work, but also I run this this event series here um, in San Francisco called The Great Progression. And the third place you might go is just on Substack. I've been, I'm writing now a monthly kind of column, you could say an essay, which is uh, The Great Progression under my name in Substack. Many places to see, uh, but a bunch of ways to catch me. And uh, <laughs> I would love to stay connected. I'd love that too. And I'll definitely make it a point to follow up soon. Thanks again, Peter. Peter makes a lot of great points, which has me thinking in a whole new way about the future. I'll admit, I have been pretty pessimistic about it lately. But when I hear about all the different technologies we will develop in the coming century, who knows? Maybe it will be an amazing future. I also remain a little skeptical about a new progressive era dominated by millennials and Gen Zers. On one hand, our political parties don't appear to be capable of addressing the threats we face, including inequality, climate change, and overpopulation. And on the other, a lot of unique things came together to create the New Deal, including FDR's historic four terms in office. Certainly, a new set of circumstances will converge this century, which may enable Americans to address the various threats we face. but. Will technological transformation and generational shifts be enough to facilitate the dawn of an entirely new civilization? I don't know. Peter seems to agree constitutional change in America is inevitable in the 21st century. However, my question remains, why would we wait if we know the one we have is at best problematic and in some ways significantly undemocratic? At some point, we will have to ask ourselves if we want to be a fully democratic nation or not. If so, we will have to confront things like the malapportionment in the Senate. We may want to adopt a more representative electoral system. We certainly might choose to reform our courts. If the current systems we use for energy, transportation, and food are all being transformed, why would we not also consider transforming our political system? After all, democracy is a process, a grand bargain between the living citizens to be improved upon whenever the people as a whole agree it is necessary. If we are going to create a new civilization in the 21st century, maybe we should use all the tools modernity has to offer. The level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen in 2021 was down to 1989 levels. The last 30 years of democratic advances have all been eradicated. These are among the findings of the Democracy Report 2022, released by the VDEM Institute at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden. Dictatorships are on the rise. They now harbor 70% of the world population, or nearly 5.4 billion people. Liberal democracies peaked in 2012 with 42 countries, while there were only 34 left standing by 2021. Maybe we should all be more concerned about the health and viability of democracy. I thought it would be a good time to talk to Alexander Eckhind about his book, Russia Against Modernity. What's happening in Russia these days, and what is the future of democracy in Eastern Europe? Tune in next time for another look at the future of democracy, this time from the point of view of the Russian people. I think it'll be a great conversation. Until then, stay safe out there.